Chronicles chapter 29, First Chronicles chapter 29, and we have been in the sermon series, The Road Less Traveled, The Road Less Traveled. There's two roads. There's a broad road, a, a wide road, a road where most people follow down that path, but that broad road leads to a path of destruction, but there is another road. Praise God, it's a uh, entered at a straight gate, it's a narrow way, and not many people go down the narrow way, but that road is a, a road less traveled, it's a road of blessing, it's a road that, that has love, it has uh, peace, has long suffering, and it's the road I want to travel down, uh, it's a wonderful road. The entry gate to that road less traveled is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by Him, by Jesus Christ. And this week... We're going to look at our opportunity we have to give, and uh, the title of the message is Willingly Offered, and we find a wonderful truth here in 1 Chronicles 29, David. You know David, he's a king of Israel, blessed of the Almighty God, and uh, King David, if you look at him as, uh, as king, and he has desires to please God with his life, he has desires to serve the Almighty God, and oh, he has desires to uh, build the temple, the place to house the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the place where it's going to have the Holy of Holies, the holy place, a place, the, a permanent meeting uh, place uh, for the, or a permanent place, the temple. And he desires to do that, but God closes the door and says, you know, David, uh, you're a man of violence. Uh, you've been a man that's gone to war. You cannot build the temple. You're not allowed to build the temple. And you think about that, David's dream of building the temple, God shut the door and didn't allow him to do it. But God still had a plan for David. David was allowed by God to give toward the building of the temple. And we find that truth right here in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And uh, you'll see this in just a moment. If you'll stand for the reading of God's uh, word, we're going to read three verses this morning, verses 11, 12, and 13. We'll read them in unison. And uh, you'll see a prayer of David after he offered willingly towards the giving uh, to this temple. So let's read these verses together, starting in verse 11. Ready? Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. And wow, uh, David looking to the Lord and, oh, thine, O Lord, is the greatness. And he began to talk, see the goodness, the majesty, uh, the uh, power of God. And we ought to praise his glorious name. This morning's title of the message is Willingly offered. Before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And uh, I pray that you help us to stop, to pause for a moment and center our focus upon your word. And this chapter, we find David rallying people to see the great work that li lies ahead in building the temple. And David sacrificially gave, and he led people to sacrificially give. And Lord, I pray that you help us to see the importance and the way to give to you, Lord. Please bless the service in Jesus' name. Amen.
Ladies, praise the Lord, willingly offered. It begins with the story of David. And David, just a young boy, a shepherd boy, imagine him out in the shepherd's field, and a man of God comes to the home, Samuel. And it begins to talk with his dad, talk with his brothers about one of his sons uh, eventually to be anointed as the king of Israel. And uh, the youngest, David, uh, gets called in. He said, that's the boy right there. That's the boy. And anoints David to be the eventual king of Israel. You know, David, he's the one that had the opportunity to eventually play the harp and soothe the evil spirit that would come over King Saul. He's the boy that was out in the field working, and his dad called him and said, Hey, you know your brothers that are fighting uh, towards the Valley of Elah? They're, they're against the Philistines. I want you to go bring them some food. And you remember David is the one that went to the Valley of Elah, and he got there, and there his, uh, the army of Israel is on one side of the mountain, and there's a valley in between. And then on the other side is the Philistines, and there's this great gigantuan Philistine named Goliath. He, oh, he's cursing the God of Israel. You, you remember the story? And David looked at a, the, uh, his brothers. He looked at King Saul, and they're hiding. And he, he roused, roused himself up, and he said, Is there not a cause? And he got wound up about the thing. And eventually, the Lord allowed David to go down into the valley of Elah, meet uh, Goliath face to face. And he took a, a stone and a sling and began to twirl it and let that sling or that rock go. And that rock was guided by the hand of God to kill Goliath right there. And glory be to God, David won a mighty victory. Oh, David had some valleys. He was uh, persecuted by King Saul. But praise God, uh, God eventually raised David up to be the king of Israel. King of Israel. David, king of Israel. And the, the kingdom expanded. Oh, what a mighty kingdom uh, David was allowed to be the king over. And uh, the center of the kingdom, Jerusalem. Oh, that mighty city, the city of Jerusalem. And boy, he began to expand. And then David, he desired a permanent place for the tabernacle. He desired a permanent place that people could go and, and worship the Lord, uh, do sacrifices where the, pre, the Levitical priests could do sacrifices uh, to the Almighty God. And Jerusalem was the place. It was the natural place. It was the place to build this temple. And he began to be consumed with that. And he talked to Nathan the prophet. And he said, you know, I want to build the, the temple. I want to build this place. And Nathan said, that's a good idea. But then God got involved and said, hey, that's not a good, uh, good idea. 
David, you're a, a man of war. And it tells us that. First Chronicles chapter 20, through, uh, 2, verse 8, it says, But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build an house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Now, stop right there. Imagine his dream of building that temple. Imagine his desire, a good desire, a good dream, right? But all of a sudden, God says, no. Well, you know, that's an amazing truth we find in this story. David didn't get mad at God. He didn't go into a fit of depression. He didn't get upset. He said, hey, boy, if the Lord doesn't allow me to build it, praise God, he's allowing my son to. And praise God, I can have a part of building the temple. And we go a little bit further, and I want you to go back to chapter 29 and look with me where the sermon begins in chapter 29, verse 1. David, by the way, is gathering the congregation together. He's uh, gathering the people of God together, and he says in verse 1, he says, Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the what? Work is great. The work is great. Ah, oh, you got to say that with me. The work is great. I just want to shout from a mountaintop, God's work is great. God's work is great. Hey, back in the beginning, throughout all the ages, the work that God has had for God's people is a great work. Whether it was the work that Adam had in the Garden of Eden to the work of, of Abraham going to a land where he'd never seen or to the work of David or to the work of the apostles, the work of God's people has always been great. The work of the Lord is a great work. That's worthy of an amen. It is. I mean, you don't normally amen. That's okay. We can, you know, wake up for just a moment to say amen. But, but listen, the work of the Lord is a great work. The Spanish ministry at our church. Well, Lord's blessing. Sister Cortez was here yesterday, and the Pastor Cortez's wife, and she came in, and she's just bubbly, exciting. And uh, she began to show me a video she took. She'd been working all week, and they had a group of Spanish children uh, coming yesterday, and 19 Spanish children came to hear the Bible story of Jonah and the whale. And uh, she had made a, a Jonah that was like this big, or a, not a Jonah, a whale this big, amen. <laughs> And uh, praise God, a little boat right there. And she showed me how the kids were singing this song in Spanish. And I don't know what they were saying. Uh, but it was, it was awesome. She was so excited. She was so bubbly about the work that God is doing in the Spanish ministry right there. Why? The work is great. Amen. The work is great. The Patch the Pirate Kids Club, they work hard at leading those kids to sing to the glory of God. And last week, do you remember when they came in here? It's, it was like they kept coming and coming and coming and coming and coming and they got up and sang the songs of God and I was thinking about the patch the pirate club is a work of God that work is a great work of the orchestra and, and that group that got up here to play just a few minutes ago play play for the offertory why are they playing for the glory of God they see that opportunity to minister to people and point people to the Lord as a great work why because the work is great Sunday school classes well, praise God for our Sunday school teachers and their love of God's word and the people attending the classes there. And boy, our, our Sunday school department, our Sunday school here at Grace Baptist, one of the greatest ministries we have here at Grace Baptist Temple. It's fantastic. Why? We're studying the work of great. Uh, the work, we're studying the word of God. We're encouraging people. We're uh, trying to point people to Jesus Christ. The work is a great work. The work of telling people about Jesus is a great work. Yesterday, it, it, we have a Saturday soul winning as normal. It was no special day. As a matter of fact, it was the rain day. That, that when it signifies, when it rains like it did yesterday, it just signifies stay home. It, that's what it tells me. And so I came here for the uh, stay at home, super, or not super Saturday, but stay at home Saturday soul winning day. Man, a bunch of people showed up. Then they're looking for me for leadership. Pastor, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to go and we're going to do. Let's load up in the van and go find people. And so we load up and pack that van full, and we ended up going to different places. And the Lord opened the windows of heaven. We began to meet people and see people and witness to people and talk to people all over. And, and praise God, uh, one of the people went into a store and met one of the store clerks right there and led the, the person to Christ, and they got gloriously saved yesterday. 
And I was thinking about it. Boy, it wasn't the ideal situation with the rain, but the people of Grace Baptist Temple, they saw what a great work, the opportunity to tell people about Jesus, we have a great work. Amen. Now, there are some, and I imagine some in David's time, that would say, David, come on. You know, you're trying to gather all this money and do all this for a temple. You're not even going to get a C. By the way, he was wrong. David did see it. But he was up in heaven when he looked down and saw it. Amen. And so he did. But, but he's saying, David, you know, it's not really that big of a deal. You're getting wound up uh, about the work of the Lord, but the work of the Lord's not. And there's always been scoffers and people that said the work of the Lord is not that big of a deal. Yesterday at McDonald's, it was part of the stop that I got. At this point, it was downpouring, and me and a couple of people went into the McDonald's and, you know, to get a couple of hamburgers, amen, and witness to people. But there's a man sitting there, and I began to talk to him, and he said, I don't believe in church. And I said, he basically said, I don't believe church is that important. And, you know, and I said, well, have you, and he said, well, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And I said, you're a Christian, and you don't believe the church is that important? And he wouldn't allow me to say it. He kept interrupting, but I was wanted to say, here's what I wanted to say. Just pretend you're him for just a No, don't be him. <laughs> just pretend this is what I said to him. I wanted to say, oh, so you don't think the, that God's institution is, the church is very great. So you, you, you don't think the institution of the church that he purchased with his own blood is an important institution. So you don't think the church, which the Bible calls the pillar and the ground of the truth, is important. I want to say, no, God's institution, the church, is a great work. God invented it. God made it. Boy, it's a great work, which leads us to, you know, not a point, but a great point. <laughs> if you have a great work, you got to have a great point, right? Amen. Look at with me at verse number three. Oh, verse number three. It's a great work, which leads to verse three. Moreover. Because I have set my affection to the house of my God. This is an important point. David set his affection to the house of his God. He set his affection on the work of the Lord. Okay, you think about that. David set his delight on the house of the Lord. David set his love, his desire upon the work that God had uh, had allowed him to get started. He didn't start building the temple, but he was, his work was to uh, prepare for the building that by giving. You're going to see that. But he set his affection, his delight to the house of God, to the work of the Lord. Okay, get this real quick. Do you understand? David saw that the work was great, and he set his affection on it, his delight, his love. Okay, I'll explain it so you, you all understand. I'll explain it in, in terms. Uh, Friday, my family and I, we went to one of the new stores that opened off of Volvo Parkway, went in there. And my daughter, Anna Joy, you know, she has long flowing hair and she's got a bubbly personality. And she wanted to hold my hand as we're going through the store there. And so as we're going and she's looking at this, looking at this and looking at this. And we got to the baker's section. And in the baking section, I saw this bottle of cherries. There were Marachiracho cherries or Maracinis, yeah, those things, those cherries. And I said, boy, Anna Joy would love some of these. Thank you, cherries. So I picked them off of there, and I said, Anna, look at this. Wouldn't this be good? And you know what she did? She just said, and just smiled. I mean, I'm not cute. She is. And she smiled. And I got her those Maracino Maricino cherries and uh, went out there. And as we're going to the van, I opened them up, and she got one of those cherries like that. And as soon as she tasted that cherry, it was, it was delight. It was like, oh, it's exciting. The only mistake I made is I let her have the thing of maraschino cherries in the van. And uh, praise the Lord, she consumed the maraschino cherries and delighted in them and ate all the maraschino cherries all up to the glory of God and spilt a little bit of syrup in our van, too. And so, but the point being, if you could have seen her, her delight was in the maraschino. I didn't force her, twist her arm. It wasn't I had to, you better eat those, girl. 
No, she had excitement in eating those cherries. It was like candy to her. That's what David did. He said, I've set my affection to the house of my God. His delight, his love was as those cherries are to Anna Joy. His delight and his affection was to the house of God, to the work of God. Wow. Praise God. Look at this. In verse number three, the way it says it, it says, moreover, because I know the work is great. Because I've set my affection to the house of my God, I have, I have of, of mine own proper good, mine own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God. He said, God has blessed me with uh, my own proper good. He says, the work is great. I've set my affection on that future house of God. Moreover, I've given of my gold and silver. I've, I've given. In other words, point three, moreover, because my affection, because the work is great, I've given. That's a great point right there. David set his affection on the house of God, therefore he gave. And that's a tremendous, tremendous truth. Okay, some of you, it's okay this morning. It's a little bit cooler than normal in the summer, so you've got a sermon illustration. You need a sermon illustration. Me, me and Anna Joy, we went to that one store, and then our family, we went to a thrift store. Pastor, why do you go to thrift stores? Well, just if you had a lot of kids, you'd go too, okay? And so we went to the thrift store, praise God. And my Anna Joy that night, she was holding on to my hand, going wherever. We looked at everything in the thrift store together. We were looking at bicycles to games and to all sorts of even girly stuff. Oh, uh, I'm not used to that in my household. And uh, praise, well, you, Anna, Andrea, so praise the Lord. But we kicked you out, praise the Lord. And, uh, um, but we got to this section where we're looking at the household uh, like cups and, and different things. And we started looking for cups. And she was showing me this cup and that cup. And then all of a sudden, I came and I saw a cup. And uh, I said, Anna, it says world's greatest dad. And I said, Anna, wouldn't it be neat if you bought this for your daddy? And she just all of a sudden perked up and smiled. And she grabbed a hold of that thing. And she held on tight to it. And with her own money, her own 50 cents, she went down the aisle and purchased this, got it bagged right there. And she was smiling. She was happy. She didn't purchase anything for herself. She purchased this for her daddy. And she couldn't wait to give this to her daddy. And by the way, uh, she's not as critical of some of you. I just want to say, she's not a very critical person. And so when she bought this, she said that she basically knew that that looks just like me. She wouldn't be critical like you and say, that's too much hair there, Pastor. <laughs> and she gave this cup to me. And you know, when she gave this to me, she, she think about it. She said her affection. She loves me. She loves her daddy. She loves spending time with me. And then when she saw this, it wasn't a burden for her to spend her own money on this. 50 cents is a lot to that girl. And she took her own money, bought it, and she offered it as an offering to me. And she willingly offered it to me. It was wonderful. It was tremendous. She gave it to me. And by the way, it's precious to me. By the way, it means a lot to me. And uh, I'll just put it, I won't put it, well, I'll put that right there so you can remember right there. The world's greatest dad. It's amazing as you turn the thought process into verse 5. Look at this. David gave his money willingly. Then he says in verse 5, the gold for the things of gold and the silver for things of silver and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of the artificers. And then it says, and who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? This is amazing start to the rest of the chapter. Who then is willing? Who then is willing? I've given. I believe it's a great work. I've set my affection on the work of the Lord. I'm willing to give. It doesn't matter that I'm going to see it built this side of eternity. It doesn't matter that it's not exactly the timing that I desire. What matters is the Lord has let me have my part. I desire. I want. Who's going to join me? Who's willing right there? And by the way, willing means a free will. Didn't force anybody. Didn't twist any arms. He was uh, without reluctance, cheerfully. David said, who then is willing who then is willing? And it's awesome because the people had a choice. And what is it? What, what happened right there? When you begin to look at it, look, look at verse number, number six. Then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes and the captain of thousands and hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly. 
And then you get that, verse number 9. Then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And the Lord, the king, also rejoiced with great joy right there. And they said, hey, let me be a part. Let me join your, the side with you, David. Let me be a part of giving toward this great work. I've got my affection towards the temple. They offered willingly. There's a man here this morning in his 90s. And put this treasure chest up in here because almost every week he comes in here. And uh, he's, if I say poor, he's a poor man. Doesn't have a lot of money. And uh, he just, he, he's poor. And I'm not being rude in saying that. But it's amazing when he comes in in the morning, he goes to this chest and begins to dump his money that he's been saving in there almost every week. And, you know, it's not the amount that you give. It's the willing heart. It's not equal giving. It's equal sacrifice. Last year, we did the miracle offering. And I remember several boys mowing lawns and praying, Lord, what would thou have me give? And I remember just being amazed at the, some of the young boys taking so much of their income that they'd made mowing lawns and looking to the work of the Lord over here, the building, saying, hey, I want to give to that. I want to be a part of that. Oh, some of our church with more means. And uh, they, they, they have, throughout the years, they've stopped and they've said, Lord, what wilt thou have me give? And there's been many of you in here who have given thousands of dollars, several thousand dollars, even more than that, uh, because you love the Lord. You want to be a part of that building. And by the way, you know what we could say? We could say, well, I would give if it was finished. I would, be, I would give if it was guaranteed to be done in this next year. I would give if God allowed me to be in that. And by the way, I understand that. But look at David. God said, no, you cannot build it. You can't even see it completed this side of eternity. So the timing was not so important. It was saying God has allowed me to be a part of that. By the way, we're meeting in a building that people sacrificially gave through uh, decades ago. And some of them probably never saw the, uh, the building complete, but they gave, they sacrificed, they worked because they knew that this generation was going to have to reach some new people. They were praying for what was going on today. And boy, we're giving, we're willingly giving, we're willing and offering, not necessarily that it's all about me, myself, and I, but we, because we see the work is great. Reaching people, the gospel is a great work. It's a wonderful opportunity. We're not having to. We get to. We uh, willingly give. We give toward it. By the way, uh, willingly offer. When you think about it, willingly, I don't have to, but praise God, I am able. Imagine being the point where, Matt, Matt, I put this in my notes. Imagine for a moment being at the point where there's no possibility of even giving anything. There's no means. God has not blessed you with anything. You're so poor that you can't even give anything. That would be sad. Wouldn't it? Imagine living that time with David. You're sitting there under David, and David says, hey, and you've never seen the temple, right? But he says, hey, you have an opportunity to give toward this great work. You know what I would do? I would be looking. I'd be searching to, to have a part in Solomon's temple. What an opportunity of a lifetime. By the way, look, look at this. This is where we began, an amazing song of praise. And you get to verse number 10. Wherefore, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, by the way, when you get to this point, oh, David, well, listen, do you think David said it like this? He, he's excited. This great work I've given. Please give. The people give. Can you imagine saying, blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. If you can just picture David with a moment. He was a little wound up every once in a while. Do you remember that he was seeing the, the Philistine over there cursing his God? He got up and he said, listen, folks, is there not a cause? And he was loud. And his brother said, shh, 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 shh quiet down, quiet down. But, but he, he was right here in the midst of this. He is intense. The work is great. Moreover, I'm given. The people begin to give. There's a bunch of joy. And you can almost see him saying, Oh, blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. 
Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all, both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Okay. Just a side note. Now, therefore, our God, I thank thee and I praise thy glorious name. That's not what it says. Because he could have said that, but it wasn't that way. He said, now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and we praise thy glorious name. And you begin to think about that. What an opportunity. The giving, the willingly offering leads to giving God glory and God honor and God praise. What a tremendous truth. By the way, uh, we're going to go into this next part of the sermon. This is an interest because sometimes sermons have sermons inside of sermons. And so this is a, an extra portion of a sermon that God gave us in the book right here in uh, chapter 29. It's a short sermon. It's uh, three inside secrets to giving. Three inside secrets to giving. It showed them giving, but then it laid down right here three great inside secrets to giving. Look with me at verse 14. You, you're excited about three inside secrets that God gives you? I'm excited. And uh, look at this. In verse number 14, but, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? Now stop there. Point number one in three inside secrets to giving, our position. Our position. Who am I? Our position is low. You think, think with me for a second. David, he is king. He, David, the one that killed Goliath. David, I am the mighty man of valor, he could say. I'm David the king. Wow, I used to jump up there and I have to step up there. And he could have said, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm the king of this mighty nation of Israel. God has chosen me. Look at me. Look at how mighty I am, how wonderful I am, how powerful I am, how rich I am, how uh, amazing I am. But that's not what he said. He said, who am I? Who am I that I'm allowed to give so willingly? And what he did is he understood his position. His position was low. God's position was high and lifted up. And so that's just so important in giving. One of the inside secrets to giving is to realize your position. Your position is low. Our God is great. We're all sinners saved by the almighty God. When you begin to think about this, which leads to uh, another point, and this is so important, think about the greatest gift ever, the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He was uh, lowly, you might say, and he humbled himself. He took a beating, he whipped, and he presented, Jesus presented himself willingly, willingly offered his life for our life. Willing offered to pay for our sins. We're all sinners, destined for hell. But Jesus loves us and cares for us, died on the old rugged cross for our sins, have eternal life. Not, not, uh, uh, not, it's not baptism that saves us, it's Jesus Christ that saves us. So you think about that, point number one, our position is low. So in order to have that three secrets to giving, our position low. Look at this again, verse 14. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willing af willingly after this sort? For, for this is point number two, all things come of thee and are of thine and of thine own have we given thee. You'll miss this. All things come of thee. David said, all things come of thee. Everything I have came from you, Lord. But not only that, it says, and of thine own have we given thee. It's yours. You gave it to us. And we're just really giving back what is already yours, Lord. What you've, or, what you've entrusted with us with, we're giving back to you. So point number two on that three, uh, three inside secrets, our possession. All is God's. Everything we own is God's. Life is but a vapor. It appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. If you read the rest of this, it says, verse 15, look at this. Just please try to concentrate and see this. For we are strangers before thee, 
and sojourners. As were all our fathers, our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. Now stop right there. He said, we're just sojourners. We're, we're, our days are just a shadow. He's saying, our fathers before us, hey, Adam had an opportunity to give. Uh, all the patriarchs, Abraham was offered an opportunity to give. God wanted him to give his son Isaac. You know what he did? He offered willingly. God did spare it, but you understand, he offered willingly. He says, it's been that way. And by the way, you go through from Abraham, all the different kings, all the people, Christians down through all of the ages, give, 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 give. And you think about it, naked came we into the world? Naked are we going to go out of the world? And you think about that, we can try to lay up treasures here in, in earth where moss and rust doth corrupt, but why? We should lay up treasures in heaven. Lay, lay up treasures. And we have the example of all the, the people before us. And David is now one of those examples, but he's just like you and me. But he realized while he was living his opportunity to be a part of a great work. So our possession, all thine. Then this last one, if you look back at uh, verse 17, he says in the last part, I have willingly offered all these things, and now have, have I seen with joy thy people which are present here to offer willingly unto thee. And our pleasure. So our position, our possession, our pleasure. He says our pleasure. In other words, he willingly offered. In other words, I don't have to, I get to. And that's a key to giving right there, is you don't ever have to give. You get to give. So the three inside secrets, our position is low, our possession all thine own, our pleasurely, willingly offered. We're almost done. When pastor says it's almost done, we might have five or six more hours to go. But not this morning. Because here's the, the simple application. Uh, and this is where I, ho I hope that we can get to. To tithe is a blessing and not a curse. To tithe. The tithe is the Lord's, it says in Leviticus chapter 27. The tithe is simply 10%. And it's the beginning of giving right there. It was amazing. We had a man in our Sunday school class. He got up. Uh, this morning, and he said, uh, I want to mention uh, a testimony. He said, I went to a church, and he said, everybody seemed to be wealthy there, and I said, I figured that they didn't need my money there, and so I never tithe. He said, I'd put my $5 in the plate or $10 in the plate, do whatever, and then he said, the pastor challenged me one time. He said, if, if you trust, uh, trust God enough to tithe, tithe, and he said, if at the end of the week, you need your tithe back, I'll give it to you, and so he said, for the first time, he gave the tithe, the tithe, and he said he looks back and he says he's done much more uh, better this side of eternity living on the 90% than with Jesus than the 100% without. What a glorious testimony. The tithe is the Lord. And the tithe, if we remember our position, low. We remember our possession, all that is God's anyways. And it's our pleasure we willingly offer. Now, our church is filled with people that tithe. And praise God for that. Praise God for that. But point two. Uh, in this, to give an offering, an offering is something above and beyond the tithe. And so to give an offering is a blessing, not a curse. And you could look at many times an off tithe and offering. It began with the tithe, and then people gave above and beyond the tithe with their offering. We do that in our church with our missions giving. And most people in here give something towards missions every week of the year. Praise God for that. Whether it's $5 or $50 a week, praise God, giving missions, an offering towards getting the gospel to a lost and dying world. The same thing with the building fund. Boy, I pray that we're giving an offering and uh, during that willingly offering in two weeks. You just say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to give? Whatever it be, praise God. Say, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give. And then we give an offering. We do it with our position low. Remember that all is God's anyways. And then our pleasure willingly offered. I'd like to ask you two questions. We'd be done. Uh, do you tithe? Do you tithe? And that's an important question. You gotta say, Pastor. Uh, that's bad. I, that's my carnal side. Uh, are you afraid to offend me? Uh, well, if you don't tithe, I'm not. I'm just kidding. That may, funny. Really wasn't. You're missing out if you don't tithe. You're missing out on the blessings of God. Number two, will you join me in praying and giving towards our willingly offering on August the 27th? Will you just join me in prayer and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to give? I'm going to close last year. 
we did the same thing. It was a miracle offering. And I remember praying a simple prayer, Lord, what wilt thou have me to give? I prayed just like most of you prayed, and God gave us a miracle offering last year, and it was amazing. But I remember as a praying, I remember going out to Campus Della Road over here, taking a left. I began to go over Campus Della Bridge, and all of a sudden the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, began to knock on my heart about a certain amount. And at first, here's what I said. I said, what? Lord, are you sure? And it really, and then I thought, oh, boy. Okay, don't. I immediately told my flesh, knock it off. I said, if the Lord puts something on my heart, boy, that's what he wants. I need to just trust the Lord. And by the way, that's a good thing. We, we kill the flesh and we yield to the spirit. Amen? That's a secret to Christian living right there. And giving that, you know what? hasn't hurt me. It's God's blessed me immensely. And just as God blesses me, he'll bless you. But remember, willingly offer. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Thank you for this great truth in 1 Chronicles 29. I pray that people go home even this afternoon and read this chapter and think about it. Lord, I pray that we have a church full of people that trust you. We realize our position is low. Realize that all that we have anyways is yours already, Lord. And help us to never give, to give grudgingly or of necessity. And God, you love a cheerful giver. And God, I pray that you help somebody maybe who's never tithed before to step out in faith and trust you in that area of giving.